Welcome along to The Rest is Football. Um, I'm Gary Lineker and I'm joined, of course, by Alan Shearer and Micah Richards, reflecting on the highs and lows of the opening weekend. Premier League football is back and um, we actually had the pleasure of watching uh, most of the opening weekend together, uh, didn't we? It was lovely, wasn't it, Gary? We've seen a lot of each other. Yeah, it's been, it's been good, though. I think... I've I've done the rounds this week though. I've been in Burnley, started off in a twelve hours in the match of the day. Then I was doing Sky yesterday. I've done the rounds. I'm putting in the, the miles for the team. You do. You're working hard. I'm working. Hard. It's good to see, Alan. What a weekend for you though. First Kane departs, uh, then Newcastle bang in five, top of the league. Then it's your birthday on Sunday. How did you celebrate your birthday, Alan? What a perfect weekend, eh? It was amazing. Um. Yeah, I'm slightly worse for wear this morning, Gary. You know, it was one of those where he'd go out for lunch and my uh, my mate said to me at about seven o'clock, come on, we can't go home yet. We can, let's go to the pub and have a couple. And it was one of those, I just I should have said, no, I've had enough. And then two or three pints of Guinness in, I thought, yeah, I'm going to regret this in the morning. So I'm slightly fuzzy this morning. So apologies if I get any of my words wrong. <laughs> uh, we'll forgive you for that. Um, delighted with Newcastle though, probably. Yeah, I thought uh, I, I thought they were amazing. I mean, we all said we thought uh, Aston Villa were going to have a, a, a really good season. Will we will we change our mind now after what we saw on on Saturday? I think it was a case of Newcastle being really really good, and I think I think Villa suffered when um, when Tyrone Mings went off with that. Uh, what it looks like a serious knee injury. Um, I think everyone sort of were were hurt by that, and I can understand that, and I think that really affected them. But I thought Newcastle was superb. Actually, Alan, as um, as you mentioned, uh, the Mings injury, and it's an injury. If it is the a, a crucial injury, which I mean, it did it did look nasty, and let's hope he gets a quick uh, recovery and back playing again not too long. Um, someone who's suffered that injury, um, how did you do yours? It was it was similar to what how he did it. You know, often the worst ones are the um, the are the ones where there's no one really around you or there's not a bad tackle. It was just a, mine was similar to his. I was running through on goal um, and against Leeds United, John Lukic was the goalkeeper. You remember him? And we just went up for a challenge and I sort of land, landed awkwardly. Um, and then I knew, I sort of knew, I thought straight away. Did you I know? Because it's not, I mean, you're not, obviously you're not a doctor or something. What is it? Is it like a sharp pain? Is it, uh, what, what's it like? Describe With it. With mine, I just felt, I just felt it rock. And and I, I mean, I got up, I was in pain. I got up and I, I wasn't like Tyrone was at the, at the weekend where he looked, he was in agony. I wasn't really in agony, but I felt, I felt something go. I felt something pop. Um, and sort of tried to carry on for the next few minutes, uh, but I realised it was it was no good. What goes through your head at a moment like that when you know that you've got a serious injury? That then was a could have been a career and an injury, but I think most injuries now you can you can sort of get by even if you have to be out for for a period of time like the seven months I was. Um, long hard days in the physio room with the doctors and the physios and you're hardly seeing your teammates and you just want to get on the training pitch and you feel as if at times there's no light at the end of the tunnel and then all of a sudden you get back on the grass and you start kicking that ball again and then you get the you get the feel of it again but it's not going to be easy anyone that has a serious injury it's it's really really tough Gary have you had any um major injuries only right at the end of my career in in Japan when I with with my toe which is it's quite quite a long story it's quite amusing in a way but um I was pl- I'd, I'd never been out longer with injury um than 2 weeks in my whole career until I went to Wow to, that's amazing it was it was yeah genuinely nuts um, got very lucky. Mind you, he never put a fucking tackle in, so I'm not surprised. Exactly. That's a good point, Alan. I got kicked a bit, though. <laughs> but it's not the kicks that hurt you or cause the bad injuries normally, unless you're really unlucky. But I was, you know, I was playing at Tottenham in the, um, a European game. Just, and I'd already agreed to sign for Japan, for the Japanese club, Grand Plus 8. For the f- like, but there was going to be an eight-month gap at the end of the season. It was all planned. There was still half a season left to go at Spurs. I was coming up to 32. And um, we were playing a second leg of a European tie at White Hart Lane. And the and I was in at halftime and we were cruising. We were well up. We were going through. And I remember saying to Peter Shreve, who was then the, the coach at Spurs, saying, oh, you know, played a lot of football. If you, you know, manage me a bit, get, you know, can I come off in a few? You know, he went, give me five more minutes. 
And I went, okay, fine. Yeah, so I played five minutes, then 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes. And I'm looking at the bench going, what? And he went, one more, one more minute, right? So then the ball goes through. I've, I think I can just nick it in front of the keeper and I just get my toe there. The keeper slides out and hits me with the bottom of his foot on the end of my toe. And it kind of shattered the cartilage. Um, and I was, I was in agony. I went straight off. And then, but I did keep playing stupidly and with injections and painkillers stuff. And I played through to the end of the season. Um, and at the end of the season, I had eight months till I went to Japan. So I had a little operation where they shaved the, like a bit of the top of the bone off and they said it would help. It didn't help very much, to be honest. In fact, <laughs> I remember the surgeon saying to me, he went, don't worry, I can make any injury worse. <laughs> I thought, well, Something that's comforting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it certainly, certainly didn't make it better. Um, and then I got to Japan and I played, you know, pre-season, went through it and it and it was it was okay. I was managing, but then I got a pain in the toe next to the other toe, like getting these little sharp pains every now and again. So this is weird. So I went to the uh, Japanese doctor, and he, he said, "Well, we'll do an X-ray." And he looked at it, and he said, "Well, you know, I, I can't see anything. You look okay. It's probably maybe a tendon thing. We'll give you a little painkiller when you go out again." I said, "Here we go again, painkillers." So I, then I played this. We played this game. It's like five, six games into the start of the season, and. Um, about 40 minutes in, I suddenly get this, like, the, my foot goes kind of spasms. It was, it was like turned into like a hook, but there was no pain or anything. It just felt really weird and I couldn't run. Getting at half time, say to the doctor, I went, God, my, this weird feeling in my foot. It's like all spasmed. He went, oh, that's odd. He had looked at it and he went, maybe when I put painkiller in that I might have hit a blood vessel or something. I went, oh, really? That's odd. <laughs> anyway, so, so, but at the end of the half time break, I'm starting to get like, I'm starting to sweat in the pain. I'm starting, to, and so I go out the second half, and within 30 seconds, I'm in, in, I'm in absolute agony. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? I'm, and I had oxygen, I was taken off, and they whizzed me straight to the uh, hospital. And what I'd done was I'd basically snapped the toe in half. So I go to the doctor the next day, and I went, Have you still got those x rays from last week? Because I thought I saw something, <laughs> but I didn't say anything because what the hell do I know about reading x-rays? So he's gone, yes, of course. And he put them up and I went, you see that little mark there? On? And he went, he went, ah, yes, this may be a fres stress fracture. <laughs> I went, oh, great. So you stuck a painkiller into my stress fracture. I snapped the joint, three months playing, and then my, my toe raised. That, that when it healed, it healed fine. Then my old injury was in agony again. That I couldn't even have the bed sheet on my foot. It was that painful. So then I spoke to the job. I said, I'm struggling here. Can I go? I, maybe if I go to London, they were going, no, we can't do that. They were worried about losing face. And I said, well, what about I find the best foot surgeon in the world? So they went, okay. So I found him in America, a guy called Lowell Scott Wild, a specialist, did the Chicago Bulls. So I go there and he's and he looks at my foot and he goes, What's happened is wh when you you've broken the other toe, it's raised and it's put way more pressure on your major joint, which he said is actually completely mush. You're screwed. He said, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to fuse your joint. Um and I went, What do I have to do this? He said, Well, you'll either be in agony or you'll do this, and it's up to you. I said, Will I play again? He went, maybe in eight months you might get he said, but it won't be quite the same. Micah, he was actually knackered before he went. There was no way he was turning that money down. He knew his toe was knackered before he went there. Hey, I, I, I signed just before that, just before I got the injury, Alan. How dare you doubt me? What's the worst injury you had, Micah? Was there a moment in a match where you went, oh, no? Snapped his eyelash. <laughs> no, he, get, he gets that trimmed about three times a week, along with his hair. No, I, I've had various different injuries, but there was the injury I had was against uh, Swansea, um, and I've had problems with my knees, but I didn't have like Alan a cruciate. I had um, it was my outside, so it's called the, the lateral meniscus, and basically it's just bone on bone cartilage. Injury. Yes, cartilage injury. The little pad in between. I have no longer got that, and I went to kick a ball absolutely shanked the ball, sort of miss hit it, and I just felt my knee go. I was trying to straighten my knee, but it was just locked in a in a bent position. And it was at that time I knew my career at City was 
in doubt because Zabaleta was behind me, but he was he was sort of just there, ready. And I knew if I was out of the team for more than a week or two, he was go he's gonna pounce. He I, pounced. He really did. But I'm I'm one of them people who always try to see the the positive in anything that I do. But it's the only time really where I've been a bit down. Yeah, in a in a different headspace where I don't know what to do. Normally I've always got the answers in terms of making myself feel better, but that was the one time where I just thought I don't know what to do because it's almost like I'd I'd been defeated. And you know, for anyone who's listening who's who's got an injury, just just keep going because it does get better. It does take time, but it does get better. When I uh, when I, sna I, I snapped my ankle in a preseason friendly at, uh, at against uh, Everton, it was at Goodison Park. That'll teach you to tackle people. <laughs> no, again, it was. I just it was. There was no one around me. I went to stretch and I, and I, I got my studs caught in the turf, and I felt it go straight away. And I looked down; it was pointing the wrong way. And I thought, oh no. Anyway, I get stretched off, um, get taken to the hospital, and the doctor comes in. He says, "Do you want the good news or the bad news?" And I said, I'll have the bad news, please. He says, well, the bad news is you've ruptured your uh, ankle joints, uh, the ligaments, you've displaced your joint, you've got a chip on the bone, and obviously you've broken your ankle. I went, fucking hell, what's the good news? <laughs> he said, the good news is, um, he said, I don't know whether it is good news, he said, but luckily for you, the person on this bed never woke up. He said, so that is the good news and the bad news. Said, oh, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, the guy before, we passed away on the bed that I was on and um, that was meant to be the good news. And again, I had another seven months on the touchline from the sidelines. Perspective, though, I suppose, in, in, in some ways. Um, looking back at the, the weekend, um, a few talking points. Um, I was quite interested yesterday because we talked about it when we worked on Match of the Day, didn't we, on Saturday night with um, um, Harlan's... Um, Pep Guardiola team talk that he got on the pitch at half time. And then we had Mo Salah yesterday, obviously very, very upset at being um, taken off. Um, were you ever, I mean, you had issues, didn't you, when um, Hullet left you out the side? Um, and so, kind of, you didn't have a tantrum publicly, though, did you? You probably did it behind closed doors. I didn't like what Pep did on Friday evening. Um... You, you say whatever you want to me in the dressing room. Have a pop at me, shout at me, scream at me, call me whatever you want, tell me whatever I've done wrong. But in the dressing room in front of the lads, don't come over and grab my arm and pull me back in, in front of the crowd when there's 30,000 there. And then, then he pushes the camera away as if to say, get away. Well, he knows the cameras are on him. He knows the cameras are going to be on him. He's done it for a reason. But I wouldn't have liked that at all. I would have told him where to go, honestly. I would have, I would have, I'd have been raging at that myself. You know when managers are on the touchline, you're playing on a bumpy pitch or a mud bath. Well, you don't, you, you didn't. Rarely. The kind of pitches that we used to play. And balls back, they whack some some centre half, knocks it into you, and the, you've got a big centre half behind you as well, whacking you. And then the ball bounces off you, and that they, they, and you all you ever hear from the side of the pitch from the manager is hold it up. <laughs> Hold it up. And I used that used to get me, especially if it was a shit ball in it. It's bouncing all over the place. And I, I often that's the only thing that made me snap. I used to I used to turn to somebody and say, I used to say, you fucking try holding it up out here. <laughs> and all that kind of well, That is right. I was the same with this. Yeah, I remember the manager shouting, keep hold of that fucking ball. And I've looked over and said, say, fuck off. It's like, yeah, it's it's um I don't honestly, it's it's part and parcel of the game. You can shout and scream as much as you want, but <clears throat> say what you have to say in the uh, in the dressing room, not in front of 30,000 on the front of the TV cameras. I know how driven he is. I know he wants perfection, <clears throat> like we all do, but uh, not that. I didn't like that. Right. What about Mo Salah, Micah? I mean, we get, strikers do get frustrated at take, being taken off because most of the goals scored, I think, generally are in the, in the last few minutes. So you always think you're going to get a goal, and he's driven by that fact. Yeah, I, I think with Salah, it was... I was looking when, when he was leaving the pitch if he was going to shake the person because that's the ultimate disrespect. So if you're having a tantrum and you go off the pitch and you don't shake the, the person's hands who's coming on, in this case it was Harvey Elliott, I think it was, he shook his hand and then he kept going. and then throw. So I, I don't mind that I because I, that's passion. In the game, the game was sort of, it fizzled out in the second half and if there's anyone who can flip it on his head, it's Mo Salah I, in a, any moment. I had a similar issue uh, with, with Stuart Pearce. He's obviously a hero. He's a, a legend of, of the game. And 
we was away down at Reading and I just remember we signed Hassan Trebelsi. It was, he was a winger, wing back and right back. And all the lads were teasing me saying, he's going to take your place. He's going to take your place. But I didn't, I didn't think he was genuine competition because I thought he was going to play ahead of me as the game goes on. You know, it's one of those things and it probably didn't happen to Hugh and Alan a lot. But when you know you're not having the best game, but you're not playing bad, when the board goes up, you just have a little glance and like, <laughs> is it is it is it me it's who's not going to be me? It's not me, is it? They yeah. didn't have a board in my day, Micah. <laughs> they used to just point you off <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm that old. And then I, I, I you know, everything goes in slow motion. It's different for for you two, but for me, I didn't well I assured him a play. So I turn round. As I look, I see number number two. <laughs> As I see number two, I'm absolutely raging. I walk over, I take my shirt off, I throw my shirt on the floor. I, it was it was absolutely bad, but I was only young at the time, and it was just that moment where. I understood what Salah was going through in terms of making it about myself, but ultimately it was about the team. And then Stuart Pierce pulled me in his office. He's like, oh, he pulled me in his office. Wow, I've never had a dressing down like that. If you ever fucking do that again, I'm gonna fucking have you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, yeah. To be I honest, like, I wouldn't take Stuart Pierce on, no, even, even, never, even with your strength. Mark. Never, never again. There's such a reaction, though, isn't there? When you know, when people, I, I get it, I understand it. You don't want to come off. You're meant to be all this nice guy. I mean, the way the game is today, isn't it? You're meant to shake his hand and shake his hand. Where it's actually, it's not a nice feeling. It's a horrible feeling that. He's taking you off, especially, I think, for a forward in the last 15 minutes or whatever it is, 20 minutes, there's goals out there, isn't there? That's when a lot of the goals are scored because everyone's getting tired, make mistakes. So you don't want to be taken off. And I, I, it always makes me laugh at the reaction of people are saying, oh, he shouldn't do that, he's doing this. Or he, I get it, I understand that. You want to be on the pitch. Talk about not wanting to get taken off. Um, it was the Romero thing at the, at the weekend yesterday um, when he... Um, he obviously scored the goal and then got taken off because he had a kind of knock on the head. It was interesting what um, Postecoglou said, um, that he wanted to protect players. I know it's quite an important issue for you, Alan, the, 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 because you did a documentary on on the whole thing. That was that was unusual and unusually um, sensible in a way, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I've not seen that too many times, to be honest. Um, I was surprised at what he did uh, in a good way. And it, I think it should, certainly should happen uh, more often. Um, I mean, there is the uh, there is the the argument that there should be independent doctors away from your own doctor, so he can make a decision. Because obviously, you've got your own interests or your 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 club's interests at heart, and the manager's staring down at you as a doctor because he, the manager, more often than not, wants the player to to be on the pitch to stay on there. So it was it was pretty refreshing to see Poster Coglu do that. Yeah, I think it was good because he took the responsibility. If I was on that that pitch, there have been times where I've been hit on the head many many times, and I've said I'm not I'm not coming off. I'd rather run through brick walls. And the manager just said, "No, you're off. Make the change." And it was the right thing to do. Let's talk Newcastle for a minute, Alan. Jeez, I, I thought I was wondering when we we're going to get on to that. Top of the league. <laughs> Top of the league. They were brilliant. What what a day. Um, my son. Obviously, we sat and watched it in the uh, in the studio together. Us three. My son was uh, my son was at the uh, at the game on the Gallagher end, and he said the atmosphere was just amazing. Um, and it was, uh, I mean, what what a day for the debutants. Um, Tonali, what a performance! Got scored after six minutes, I think. Um, and then Harvey Barnes coming on goal and assist. Anthony Gordon was brilliant. Isak, he just couldn't handle him. I think the second half performance. Going down the hill towards the Gallagher end, it was amazing. So to to score five in the way they did, I mean, there's a lot of expectation. There's a lot of can Newcastle do what they did last season? Um, that's a bloody good start, and it was it was good to watch. Hold on, one of the early pods that we did, you was playing down Newcastle, saying I'm not sure what they're gonna do, and now. They've won one game. No, no, I didn't say I wasn't sure what they were gonna do. I said I had them in fifth. How could you have them in which, fifth? No belief. Which 
will probably be enough to get into Champions League football if they finish fifth. When you look around at what everyone's or what they've done, I mean, Chelsea have spent ridiculous money. Liverpool have improved. They're going to hope they're going to sign another midfielder or they're desperate for another midfielder. What Man United have spent, what Man City have spent. So, yeah, it's going to be Says tough a team for them with the to finish owners. in the top four. <laughs> You've got some front that <laughs> Finan- financial fair play. Mike, Mike shall we get the violin out for him? <laughs> I mean, really, what's going? On? But actually, we, you're talking about great debuts um, there, um, which brings us to the chance to talk. What was your What was your best ever debut? Didn't you score? Was that <clears throat> well? Or? Let me tell you, Mr. Lineker. I think I am still the youngest player to score hat trick in top flight. And that was on my debut. I know it was, which is which is quite an achievement. 17 against Arsenal at the Dell. Micah's probably never heard of the Dell. Have you heard of the Dell, Micah? Yeah, only because we did it in the, before. We've had this conversation before, just, but I didn't know what the Dell was before now. <laughs> yeah, the Dell, old Southampton, 17 year old against Arsenal. Yeah, scored a hat trick on my debut. That must have been amazing. Never scored for the rest of the fucking season, though, so yeah. <laughs> How many games did you play? I think I played about another seven or eight, but uh, it was in April. So there's seven or eight games left, but I never scored again that season. What was your best debut? Oh. Or did you have a good one? Yeah, it was, <laughs> It was. I grew up an Arsenal fan, didn't I? So um, not a lot of people know that actually, because I went to Manchester at 14. Everyone thinks I'm a mank, but I'm actually a Leeds lad. And I love Thierry Henry and, and Vieira. And... My debut was um, Highbury away. And just as an Arsenal fan, being in the team and then... Because when, when, when you you travel, or when we travelled back then, you always used to bring like 21 players or two more who, if anyone gets injured or if anyone's ill, they're coming to the team. So I had no, no clue that I was going to be on the bench that day so I thought I was just going to be one in, in the stand then I just remember Pierce reading out the uh, you know the starting lineup and then the bench you know because you're not even really you're thinking we're thinking about what pies we're going to eat because when you were <laughs> it was <laughs> when, you, when you're that age I, I, was, I was 17 you don't think you're going to be involved you know you're doing quite well but you're just thinking oh who's got the best pies what are we going to get for, for after are we going to have a drink at half time all them sort of things and then I was in, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm I'm in. And then you, you go in, and you see Thierry Henry warming up and Vieira. And not only that, Stuart Pearce brings me on. But don't bring me on as a defender. It brings me on as a striker. As a striker? I was absolutely... Did you match Alan's hat-trick? Useless. <laughs> was, was, he just goes, go up there and cause some, some fucking carnage, son. So... I, <laughs> You know what Pierce is like? I went up there throwing my arms and legs and everything. But I did get one chance. It come to me. I chested it down. It was um, Dennis Bergkamp-esque the way I chested it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a shot. And I absolutely shanked it. And it was a it was a good day for me, but it was a it was a shit day. Dennis the Menace-esque in the end. <laughs> exactly the that. But, uh, oh, come on. Tell us yours. Well, I'll tell you about Stuart Pearce. My, I mean, obviously, I played with Stuart and um, I, I loved him to bits. He was a br- brilliant fullback for England when, when I played and he was amazing. And, you know, and we were all heartbroken when he missed that the penalty, in, obviously, in 1990, um, one of the key penalties in that shootout. And then amazing, wasn't it, when he played with Alan and he took the penalty shootout when we beat Spain. And that was one of the most emotional things. I was in the crowd and I actually had tears in my eyes because... I just wanted him to score so much, um, but I remember playing at uh, at the City Ground in, in against Forest um, when when Stuart was playing there. And you know what he's like? He's quite he's quite straight. He doesn't laugh a lot. You don't. He do, he's not. You know. You never know whether he's happy. Even when he scored a goal, he was like aggressive, wasn't he? <laughs> and and um, I, I, I played in this one game. It's the only time I've ever seen him actually laugh out loud. He had a free kick about thirty yards out, and I was in the wall. <laughs> So he hit this, did this long run up and he smashed it. It went straight in my orchestra halls, right? <laughs> and um, 
I, I went down like this and he just looked at the crowd and he was laughing his head off. <laughs> he was going to sit on me. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of um, um, debuts, um, I, 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 my Barcelona one was amazing. I scored after two minutes, which took the pressure off. But um, Everton was slightly different. Certainly my home debut, we'd, just, we'd lost the first game of the season away at Leicester. That was my first game. Um, back at my old club and I remember at half time we were 2-0 down Everton to Leicester and Mark Bright had scored a wonder goal who took my place and um, we were 2-0 down and he, I went in at the old Filbert Street down the tunnel and I went in the home team dressing room didn't I I'd been doing it for eight years and I walked out and they all went hey what are you doing I'm going oh god it was the most embarrassing embarrassing thing ever and then the next game we're playing Midweek game at Goodison. It's the first game um, for Everton. They've just signed me in the summer, replaced Andy Gray, who was massively popular there at the time. And as I, I went on the pitch, and you know, when you're doing the warm up, and they're reading the team numbers out, and they go like, you know, so I'm saying, no, I say, Kevin Ratcliffe, no, number seven, Trevor Stephen, number eight, Gary Lineker, and the whole crowd, boo. Not the whole crowd, but certainly elements of it. All the other players were cheered, and I thought, oh, God, what, what have I done here? I, I didn't score until about my about the fourth game, so I was I was getting pelters, but all was all was well in the end. Welcome back to the rest is football with me, Gary Lineker, uh, Michael Richards, and Alan Shearer. And um, let's go back to um, the Chelsea Liverpool game. You had um, not only the interest on the pitch, and it ended up a draw, but we've also got this strange thing going off the pitch with uh, Moises Caicedo, who was. Um, Obviously, we all thought was going to Liverpool, and and now it it seems that it's um, done deal with with Chelsea for a hundred and fifteen million pounds. Um, these kind of kind of midfield players, holding midfield players, <laughs> they they're almost as expensive as goal scorers these days. It's ridiculous. It, it, they shouldn't be that much, but they're so important to the team. If you was watching Liverpool versus Chelsea yesterday, how easy it was to go from back to front had. McAllister in there did well. Sabloshlai at times did well. But they're just missing that screening in front of the, the, the back four or back five, however you, you want to call it. And it was exact same for Chelsea as well. Um, I thought Enzo Fernandez played really well, a bit more advanced the positions that he was picking up. But then like Gallagher did really well, had a good game. But the, the, the only reason he's, he's worth 115, 120 million is because Everybody needs that position. He's not worth that normally. But no one's worth the kind of fees that are around, realistically. But that's that's not what it's about. You've got to get that player. What they should have done, perhaps, was had a penalty shootout at the end of the game to see who gets him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. bonkers. Chelsea's fault anyway. As soon as they paid 100 and, or over 100 million, 105 million, whatever it was, for Enzo Fernandez, that was the bar set. There was no way um, Declan Rice was going for lower than than what they paid for him, and then of course the interest I mean, that Liverpool showed in him was only going to pump his value up. Um, I mean, Brighton have played a blinder as they normally do in in terms of their uh, their transfer business. What did they buy him for? Four million or something was it? Yeah, a something year ago? Like yeah, eighteen months ago. It's not a bad profit, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy money. But if someone's prepared to pay it, then. That he's uh, he's he's gonna no, go. But he could be the difference between them getting Champions League and cementing that um, that sort of. When you look at the rest of the teams in the league and Chelsea, we all didn't know what to expect, did we? This weekend, we was all they lost a lot of players, brought in a lot of players. Bringing him in gives them a basis for then. Okay, we're fighting for Champions League, and then. The window's not open. Let's bring in some some more because that's what everybody needs. I think if they get Kaiseido done, or it looks like it's going to be done, doesn't it, yeah, Gary? Yeah. It's pretty much seal, a sign and seal. Then I think Chelsea could be a very good team this year. Yeah, yeah. Poch seemed to have... You, you could see a difference from last season um, immediately, couldn't you, Alan? Yeah, there's... Um, I mean, I didn't see a lot of the game. Um, I saw bits of it. <laughs> he was too drunk. <laughs> oh, no. Don't worry, me and Gary will do all the we research. Will, we'll do all the work I've been on the I've been on the road for three days. <laughs> I wasn't pissed at that stage. It was later on. I was watching the uh, I watched bits of it. What I saw, they looked very well organised. Looked a different, certainly a different team to what we uh, what we saw last year. Um, but I agree, Micah. I think um, 
with him in there. And who knows, even if they get uh, Lavia, they're on about that as well, then I, I think they'll, they'll be strong, yeah. What I found interesting is that suddenly kind of the more defensive-minded midfield players seem to be costing more than the, the creative midfield players, which is actually a more difficult skill. So you've got Tonali, for example, um, at Newcastle, who was fan- fabulous. What did he cost, Alan? 50? 55. And then you've got Madison at Tottenham, who also played really well and, and obviously created the first goal for free kick. Um, for 40 and those players they do the difficult things they create opportunities to score they'll score goals as well it's it's a it's a weird one isn't it I think uh, I think correct me if I'm wrong but I think Caicedo got two goals last season and two assists and 115 million I mean what on earth is going on it is just bonkers but he's the player that'll break it up. He's the player that'll give them a little bit of solidity to stop the ball getting into the uh, into their um, back four. So yeah, there's an important position. But my God, 115 million—it's crazy. Yeah. Anything happened over the weekend that changed your views in terms of the title race, top four? Anything? I I think maybe seeing Chelsea, you would say perhaps they'd be closer top four than perhaps we thought they would be beforehand. Yes, I, I think I think Chelsea. I think Chelsea will be a, a very good team. It was always that moment in the game. So the 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 second when Salah went through and scored, but it was marginally offside, and 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 Chelsea reacted in in the right way. And I was at the game, and there was a positive energy. Of course, first game of the season, new manager it always is, but it just felt like there was a, a good atmosphere at Chelsea, and we can't say for that for the last couple of seasons. I think you, you, you're probably right. Um, I, just, I want to go abroad for a little while. We don't want to just concentrate solely on, on the Premier League and also we'll talk hopefully lower league football because um, Leicester have got a, off to a good start at some point in, <laughs> in the future. Um, a couple of English players playing a, abroad. Harry Kane obviously came on. He, he couldn't, they managed to lose. The, did you see that Danny Olmo's goal though? I, I missed, it's a, a little bit Berg Camp-esque eh? talking about yeah. your, you, you compared yourself to him. Uh, earlier on, um, he scored a hat trick in that game, so well, he still hasn't got a, a, a trophy. But it, it's all done um, over there, Alan. Yeah, no, it was, we sat and watched it, didn't we, together on uh, <clears throat> on Saturday evening, and um, we we're urging him to come on a bit sooner than he uh, than he did. Um, I think I know we joke about it and laugh about it, etc., because of the, the record. But I do think it's the right move for him. Um, I do think he's given himself a great opportunity of winning the Champions League, which ultimately is what he wants to uh, what he wants to do. And him going there will only strengthen their case. I've been doing match of the day what three years now, three four years, and that's the happiest I've ever seen you <laughs> on Saturday. It was because Newcastle won. Kane was away. You you normally a right boring twat. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean, Michael? That's, that's, a, bit, that's a bit strong. Yeah. Well, that's the happiest. Be like that every week, please. Because okay. we had a great time, didn't we? It was great fun. It, it, was, it, was, it was. We had a laugh all day long. Um, the other one I want to talk about is, is I, I mean, I don't know whether you saw it, but I, was, I, I watched it because I watch a lot of Spanish football. Um, Jude Bellingham. <sighs> his La Liga debut for Real Madrid. I mean, boy, oh boy. This... He's a monster, isn't he? Oh. God. So special. I mean, he was bossing it. He was running the game. He was telling all these great players what to do. And he was... How have we missed that talent? So, obviously, he's at, he's at Birmingham. He wasn't missed. How have we allowed him to go abroad so early? But it's been really beneficial towards him. It's, it's like he's, he's been become mature very quickly. I think it was... I mean, Dortmund is a, and Germany is a great place, I think, f- to emerge. I think it's, his education will be really good and probably better in terms of his football education I'm talking about. I, I think it's perfect. I think it's perfect. I mean, I know for a fact that Manchester United were desperately to try to sign him when he was at, from Birmingham. I know that for a fact. Um, and I'm sure other clubs were the same because I think, you know, f- f- for Birmingham to retire someone's shirt was a 16-year-old, we yeah, you, but- you sort of think, well, this is, there's, there's something special. That was a big statement, wasn't it? That, I, thought, I thought that was a bit over the top at the time, you know, but it, yeah, what a talent, what a player. Um, it's been brilliant for him. I mean, it's just worked out perfect for in, in terms of his decisions and what he's done. Um, and if you, you know what? If you didn't have a clue about football and you didn't know who he was, um, and you you would just if you and you were sat listening to to this lad talking, you'd think he's the most experienced, well educated, 
just a great lad. He's just sounds, he sounds like his football. He sounds amazing. Um, clever, intelligent guy. Yeah. It really is impressive. It's going to be great watching his um, progress, um, not only for Real Madrid, but for, for England as well. I also want to talk about um, the Lionesses. Um, semi-finalists now, played much better in the quarterfinal uh, against Colombia. Good victory there, coming from behind as well. And um, now they've got what they call them, the Matildas. Matildas. The Aussies. That's, and they, they, you know, obviously nil-nil with them and they went on a penalty shootout, which is an amazing scene. So, I don't know, you saw the shot of the airplane where every single TV on this thing was on, uh, was watching the shootout. Um, that's what football It was the best was. performance, wasn't it? I thought it was from, um, from, what, I, from what I saw. Uh, great character coming back from, uh, from one nil down. Certainly will give them confidence. We all, we all said about that they haven't played well, but that must be a good sign. Um, but I did think that was their best performance. And... Um, they're going to have to step up again, aren't they, against Australia? It's going to be tough. Like You remember we, we talked about this. They've not played at the best, but I thought that was a good thing because when it clicked, it was only going to help it's them. It's how you end the tournament, it's not exactly, how you start it. How, how, yeah. yeah, exactly that. Um, but I actually give England a very good chance of, of winning this now. Well, they're in the semi-final, Michael. Yeah, but like normally you're thinking, oh, Oh, Spain or this, I'm not. Now I'm thinking, okay. Well, France have gone, Japan have we, gone. We can win this. We can, we, we can win this. I, I think they've got a really good chance of actually bringing it home. Well, fingers crossed. We'll, we'll certainly be watching um, that one. Now, we're going to end this um, with something that we're going to do every week, and it's called uh, The Moment of the Weekend. Um, which we'll pick out. Um, it might be something serious. It might be something amusing. Um, this this week's I thought was quite amusing. Uh, Roy Hodgson's little touchline spat with Max Lowe. <laughs> uh, one of the most unlikely sign of... Well, can we describe it as a pun shop? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was brilliant, wasn't it? 76. And I see, I seen his top lip go up with the anger. And he wanted, it was, I mean, he didn't put his fists up really, but you could see he was edging towards him. I texted him yesterday, you know, Roy, I texted him saying, I got, I got, I've got to tell you, I said, I fucking loved what you did yesterday. He said, I just got a bit carried away in the game, Alan. I apologize. I said, no, it was brilliant. I loved it. It was amazing. It just shows you though, doesn't it? You know, because you, you always go Roy Hodgson, the manager, the coach, always oh, seems like such a gentleman, such obviously really intelligent, speaks well. Can't imagine, imagine him getting angry, but you know, you've got to have that side a little bit as a coach. And it came out even on that touchline spat, didn't it? There's a, there's a clip going round from years ago and there's a, a guy at a stadium. He's like, do you want some? I'll give it to you. And it just reminds me <laughs> of, of, of that moment. I mean, people listening will will, will know what the, the, the clip is, but it was just brilliant. We want to see that. We want to see characters. Um, and for someone who's normally so cool to lose it, it's always good to see. <laughs> 76. Brilliant. And before we go, we've got a, a fantasy team out. Mm. Uh, we've, we've, we're playing the game. I, neither Alan nor myself have ever done it before. We're doing it as a team thing. We're relying very much on Micah's experience as a as a massive fan of this. How are we doing, Micah? We tinkered a little bit. So when we first recorded, and I was, I was finding a way to get Salah in, but I wanted Rashford and Madison. And we're doing all right. We're doing all right. We've got 71 points so far and Rashford still to play tonight so we should get over 80 points for the first week is very good come on marcus bring it on um <laughs> alan micah thank you very much and uh, thank you all for listening and thank you too uh, for your amazing comments uh, in the first week um for your support and your love of the podcast it's massively appreciated